Good evening, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to you all to uh, CILT's annual Sir Robert Reed Rail Lecture. Um, let me start with the boring bits. Uh, the fire drill. There is no planned fire drill. So if you hear what I'm told is a very distinctive klaxon, you will kindly leave the building up there or through the door you came in. Uh, there's no assembly point, but Carnaby Street's just around the corner if you <laughs> want to look backwards to London's great 60s, which I sometimes have been known to do. Right. <laughs> The background to this lecture, which is, uh, and there's only one of these each year, is uh, that it uh, was set up in memory of Sir Robert Reid, who was chairman of uh, British Rail in the early 1980s. I was very lucky to have met him a couple of times. I was working as a consultant and uh, working on behalf of various bits of um, BRB, um, and he, he was, even to me, uh, a fairly remote person from the, uh, the industry, I guess. He was somebody very distinctive. Uh, and I think he uh, made quite a difference to what was a very, very capable organisation and imparted it with a new capability, um, which kind of stood the test of time, because when it came to privatisation, sort of ten years later, actually the people that many of whom he kind of nourished, survived the change and made a great success of it. Um, and I'm delighted that his son, Bob Reed, is here. Bob, do you want to just... You have to stand up just in case anybody doesn't believe it. <laughs> That's Bob, with whom I've had the pleasure of working a couple of times. So um, it's lovely to see you here, Bob, and um, thank you for coming. Right, well... Um, as a consultant, which I've been nearly all of my life, apart from a brief stint in the SRA, I have the great joy of going around the world and meeting people. Um, and every now and then you meet somebody who you think, well, you know, this is somebody who brings together a, a couple of great combinations of things that really make them great to work with and quite inspiring. And uh, so I don't want to embarrass Stephen, but he's one of them. Uh, and the reason why he's, uh, I think, a, a, an inspirational as well as a very important player in the rail scene in the US is, is really because of his background, because he started off doing the good old simple operating the railway things, dispatching trains, as it's called in, in the US, in places and for companies that have very home counties names like Guildford Rail Systems and Buckingham something or other. <coughs> well, sounds, you, you can see where the people who started off those places came from. Anyway, so home counties kind of people. And then moved into, uh, in effect, a, uh, the, the politics of life, working in, uh, in D.C., as they say over there, working on the hill, um, helping support the politicians dealing with surface transportation, rail, helping to draft legislation. And I... I've come uh, in, in many, many places to, to meet people who've said, oh, Amtrak, you know, I love the job of sorting that out. Well, Stephen's got that job, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty cruel way to put it. But Stephen joined Amtrak in 2008, 9, uh, and then took up his current post in 2011, which is, and it's quite a long title, it's uh, his vice president for the Northeast Corridor Infrastructure and Investment Development. And no doubt he'll explain to us what that covers and what it doesn't cover. But just prior to that, he had an overarching policy role uh, within our Amtrak, so he does know the whole picture. So uh, I'm lucky to, enough to have worked with Stephen through 2011-12. Um, so I know a bit about this, but you you probably think, well, the U.S. is a strange place. And, then, you know, for us poor little Brits, it is. So let me just explain one thing. The Northeast Corridor is like Britain. Lop off the bits. I'm going to see how many people I can offend. Lop off the bits that don't matter. That's East Anglia, the West Country, and Wales. And the top half of Scotland. And 
and then sort of just tilt it over a bit, shift everything onto the east coast, you know, because who wants to go to the west coast? It rains there. And then think about it, you've got R York in the middle of that. It's probably got a bit nearer the sea by then. Well, let's think of it as New York. Give it the population of London. Washington's up there. Move it down the bottom. Boston, move it up the top. And that's it. It's the same scale as the Northeast Corridor. The core of Great Britain, where most of the people live, is just the same size, the same distances. Uh, and it's uh, actually very importantly uh, connected by rail more than anything else, as Stephen will tell you. Anyway, it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, this year's Sir Robert Reid um, speaker, uh, Stephen Gardner. Thank you, Jim. I, um, I think you certainly described someone other than me, but I, I'm happy to take the accolades. I, um, it's a huge pleasure, really, for me to be here, um, and, and particularly... Um, I, I just want to thank Jim for, for both his, his, his uh, two nice comments and uh, for arranging to uh, invite me. It's um, particularly uh, an honor f to be presenting a lecture uh, in the name of uh, Sir Robert Reed, who I, I have a, a former BR man uh, uh, who works for me, a, a man named Andrew Wood, maybe so some of the BR folks in the room might, might know him. Um, He's given me a lot of uh, uh, good history and uh, just about the importance of uh, uh, Sir Reed's role at, at BR. And so it's really actually a pleasure. And there's a few things that I think that we actually are, are sort of undertaking that have um, uh, we have him to thank for probably in, in one way or another. So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to start here. Let me just, before I begin, uh, uh, Andrew, who works for me, always tries to correct me uh, about the proper terms for railway uh, uh, railways, and, and uh, I, I, I will try to observe, uh, observe them, but when I say tie instead of sleeper or, or the like, um, forgive me. And, and if you have questions, if it seems like I'm talking about something that's just crazy uh, at the end, let me know, and, and I'll see if, uh, if, in fact, I am talking about something that's crazy or if I'm just using the wrong term. Okay. Um, I am going to focus primarily on the Northeast Quarter today, but I'll just start with a little introduction to Amtrak. Um, so, wh who are we? We are America's intercity passenger railway. Um, we actually, uh, I, I should be wearing my birthday hat today. Today is our 43rd birthday. Uh, we were started in 1971 on this inf very day. Um, and um, through really a uh, a, a very challenging history. We, we are a, essentially a preservation strategy for uh, an industry that was in bankruptcy or on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, and, um, and, and passenger rail was taken uh, essentially away from private operators and put into a, uh, a, a public vehicle to preserve uh, the system as it, as it um, sort of existed at the time. Um, we operated a 21,000 mile route system across the country about 20,000 employees uh, serving 46 states in Canada. Um, and I, I think a you know, very sort of important fact to understand that explains a lot about our system, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, is that majority of the railway we operate over we do not own. We are a, a tenant uh, on uh, the freight railroad network. Um, and we operate uh, a, a little more than 300 trains uh, a day. Um, we are a strange beast, um, <laughs> uh, particularly in the U.S. We, we, we are, we are a, uh, a, a unique experiment. Um, we are a congressionally chartered for-profit corporation who is owned by the U.S. government primarily, though we do have some non-governmental and railway shareholders whose shares are worth nothing and who have no control. Um, and um, we have an interesting uh, uh, modern statutory mission from, from Congress, which is to provide trip time competitive modern uh, inner city service. Um, but then Congress isn't actually all that serious about having us do just that. Uh, so we do a lot of other things in addition to that. Um, we have a presidentially appointed board of directors that runs the company. And that also includes the Secretary of Transportation uh, for the US uh, Department of Transportation. Um, and then our policy, in addition to being set by our board, is set also by U.S. Congress and um, by the United States Department of Transportation. And they do that through a couple of different vehicles. Authorizing legislation, which um, 
uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm envious of sort of the some some of the the, uh, the situation I understand in Parliament uh, in terms of being able to create sort of a unified authority to undertake projects. Here we have a process of authorizing sort of policy and programs, and then a separate process of providing dollars to carry out those programs. And they're um, somewhat disconnected, and they're done differently in the two uh, chambers of our legislature. Um, and the end of that process produces dollars uh, against an authorization, typically. And then all of our money comes to us through uh, an agreement with the U.S. Department of Transportation. So they then sort of overlay their own interests on top of the funding that comes to us, and we execute our program. Um, our funding levels just generally are about a billion and a half dollars, a little less, 1.4 billion uh, in federal funding um, on an annual basis. Every once in a while, the sort of heavens open and a big pile of cash drops down, usually with almost no warning, and then just as quickly goes away for another decade. Um, that's been essentially our, our history. Um, we, we have sort of have about 400 million, a, a, a bit less now, for operating expenses for the railway, and, and then a billion for capital and debt um, for, for the network. The, the lines of business um, that, that we operate are um, re really these six. We have the Northeast Corridor uh, operations, which are the, the train services that we provide over the Northeast Corridor. We have the Northeast Corridor infrastructure, which is really the group that, that I run part of. And that is the assets that Amtrak owns in the Northeast, and I'll spend lots of time on those, that uh, we utilize but also provide for use uh, to commuter railroads and freight railroads. Um, long distance services, which are our big routes that cover the, the country, as you remember the, the sort of first map I've shown, these long lines, these are you know, thousand mile or more trains that operate typically overnight. Um, then we have state supported services, which are our corridors outside of the Northeast that are uh, short distance, usually three to 500 miles, multiple frequencies. Um, and they're done in partnership with the states. In essence, we run a kind of cooperative with the states for those services. Commuter services, where we are a contract operator, um, usually co competitively procured uh, for regional authorities. And then finally, um, our corporate assets, real estate, you know, expertise, uh, and so forth, which we, uh, which we do make available in, in certain instances. Um, as I sort of started at the beginning, the, the thing to always remember in the United States is that it's a freight railroad. Everywhere, everywhere you, you think about railroads in the United States, first think freight. Um, it's about a 200,000 mile network um, and, and, and fluctuates up and down. It's um, primarily dominated by seven major private railways. Um, who uh, have carved up the universe, essentially, typically into duopolies. Uh, and, um, and then infilled with about 500 little railways. Uh, and, and as Jim described, my career has mostly been with those little, little railways, regional and, and short line railways that, that uh, operate the lower density portions of the network and connect to the big system. Um, there's, you know, freight is a huge part of the American economy. The freight railways are probably 45% of ton miles uh, in terms of freight movement in the U.S., very significant player, and we operate, I'm sure as well as you know, big, long, two-mile, 18,000-ton freight trains uh, all over the place, and um, uh, they're a very uh, sort of successful uh, part of the current transportation scene in the United States. Um, and public ownership just and, and public operation of railways is absolutely the exception. Um, with the exception to that rule being commuter railroads, which are essentially all publicly owned, um, and most of them own their own infrastructure, but some contract with others to access infrastructure. So just sort of generally, what's Amtrak's history been? Um, you know, we, uh, I won't go through all 43 years, I'll focus here on the, the more recent ones. We, we've had our ups and downs, uh, both with the market and um, uh, and with our funding and our equipment and so forth, but the past decade has been pretty spectacular for us. Um, and it's really, it's come to be that, that rail has um, developed into, uh, once again, I think a very meaningful um, portion of the transportation landscape of the United States, albeit in certain corridors uh, where you'd expect rail to be meaningful. Um, 
And here you see sort of what's been happening. We've been growing ridership. We're now about 31 and a half million riders on an annual basis, um, up from 20, you know, right at, right at the end of the uh, 1990s. And um, part and parcel with that, we've been able to reduce our operating loss. We're operating, operating subsidy now, so we're in the low 300 millions. Um, and that's been a, a huge change uh, for us as our fare box uh, recovery has increased pretty dramatically. We're now up to about 90% in fare box recovery from, from revenues. Um, ticket revenues are about $2, $2 billion. Um, and we've set revenue and ridership records for 10 of the last 11 years. The only year we missed was 2009. Um, and we like to think there's a pretty good reason for that called the global economic uh, collapse. Um, and, and we basically sort of were at parity with the prior year. Um, I think we're, we're on, on track to set another record year uh, this year. Um, and actually, we're very proud we, we set a record in uh, last year because we had some major disruptions, particularly in the Northeast, including, including Hurricane Sandy. And we lost about $50 million in ticket revenue uh, from those in its incidents and, and, and also incurred some significant operating costs and still managed to beat our prior year. Um, dr driving the change in performance at Amtrak has really been this trend, which is um, performance on the Northeast Corridor. And uh, what's really driven this, though not entirely, is the introduction of the Acela service, um, which was our uh, high-speed product, which we introduced really sort of fully in 2002. Um, and what, y what you can see is essentially a doubling in revenue in a decade um, from roughly 500 a million dollars up to, to now over a billion, we're essentially $1.1 billion in, in ticket revenue in the Northeast Corridor. Um, and we're doing that with not that many trains and not that many frequencies, uh, but with pretty substantial pricing power because we've got um, a good product in what is a quite degraded transportation market where the, all the other options continue to get worse and we're sort of holding our own if and occasionally getting better. Um, he, here's a picture of the Northeast Corridor. And, and again, it's really going to be my focus uh, today because I think it, um, it's instructive about what's possible in the United States. We, we always like to refer to the Northeast as the prototype railway. It's, um, it's got unique characteristics, but these characteristics in sort of, sort of shades, usually gradations, are available in the Pacific Northwest, in the Vancouver, Seattle, uh, Portland, Oregon corridor, um, in our major California markets from San Francisco, uh, Sacramento, LA, San Diego, um, and in some of our Midwest corridors. And eventually the South, though the South is sort of the lost land of passenger rail. Uh, one day we, we dream of, uh, of, of things in the South. Um, so it's essentially 900 uh, route miles if you include all the branches in its sort of extensions. It's really sort of the typical definition for the corridor, or the main line as it's called, is from Washington DC here up to Boston here. And as Jim said, it's um, in, in many ways similar to, uh, to um, I think, portions of the UK rail system and, and quite similar in many respects to the West Coast main line uh, from an operating perspective. And also um, move things around and bring our hub down a bit, not totally dissimilar to JR East's network as well. Um, you know, the bulk of it is electrified. The entire main line is in the branch out here to Harrisburg. Um, hosts, it's a, it's a mixed traffic railway hosting uh, inner city, high speed, by our standards, and uh, commuter and freight traffic. Um, about 260 million annual passenger trips on this railway um, between the combination of those services and, and again, sort of the prototype. And these different colors and things represent the total network. Uh, it's owned by a whole bunch of different folks, which I'll get into a little bit later. And there are these commuter networks that uh, overlay and feed into and primarily rely on the Northeast Corridor as their main conduit to the city center. Um, and so you have networks in uh, Washington, both commuter and subway, Philadelphia, commuter subway, streetcar, elevated train, New York, as you all know, massive transit system, commuter system, and uh, same in, in Boston. 
Um, let's just talk about the Northeast Corridor for a second as a region. It's a, um, I mean, I'm a Northeasterner, so it's hard for me to not sound sort of a jerk in exclaiming its importance. But it, it just is incredibly important to the U.S. economy. It's about 20% of the GDP and about 2% of the land mass. Um, it's got 17% of the population. It is the economic, cultural, and academic capital of America. There's just no question that those three things are true. Uh, throw in the fashion industry. Um, you have many, many major uh, um, industries that are based here. And um, it's uh, really, as a region, the, the fifth largest economy. It's just after you take the GDP. It's just right behind Germany and right ahead of France. Um, so it's an incredible economic region. Um, and we're very lucky to be really in the center of it, um, which is both a blessing and a curse. We've got all these great markets. It also means we're very constrained and sort of hemmed in. Um, one in three jobs in this region are within five miles of an NEC station. So it, huge density of employment around our nodal points. Um, and the workforce that uses the NEC on an annual basis gives about 50 billion to, to the annual GDP. So it's a very important uh, part of the country and the railway is very central and important to it. Um, just to give you sort of kind of comparison here of kind of you know, typical major high speed corridors that you would see. Um, see there's some, some good comparisons. So the thing that is unique about the Northeast Corridor is this, which is at our massive market, 19 uh, here strong, is in the middle of our corridor, um, which is, is, is quite different than th these two, for instance. Uh, um, and so that permits uh, a, an interesting traffic pattern um, between the, the outlying areas into the center. Um, and um, but as you can see, it's a it's sort of comparative, and, and, and we benefit from having, so the just this is the first largest city in America. This is the fifth largest city in America. Most people, I live in Philadelphia. Most people don't think of Philadelphia as sort of, you know, a big deal, but it's, uh, it's actually the fifth largest city. Uh, Washington is um, the sixth, and I think Boston is now the 11th. So um, some so major, major places in, in, in the nation here. Um, we have a complex operation. It's about 2,200 to 2,400 daily trains. Um, and they're of all site, uh, all sorts. So as you can see, we're um, a very small user of a railway we primarily own, about 140 daily trains. The vast, vast majority are these 2,000 daily commuter trains, which consume massive amounts of our infrastructure and huge portions of the capacity, as you would expect. Um, and then we have these 60 or so, 70 freight trains. Here's a picture of a, a Norfolk Southern Manifest Freight. Um, and uh, they're out there day and night um, running 120 car unit oil trains now, a lot of, uh, a lot of oil coming into the corridor, um, intermodal trains to ports, and then general, general freight trains up and down the railroad. Um, so the challenge here is getting all this stuff to work. We have 100 and 35, 150 mile an hour fast trains, 70 mile commuter trains, and 40 mile freight trains all occupying the same space and vying for, for capacity. Um, here's just a kind of graph of, of train movements. Um, this is what we call the sort of Himalaya range right here. This is uh, Penn Station. And um, Amtrak is the, the, the sort of light blue here. We're the one end-to-end -end user. And again, we own most of the corridor, but not all of it. Um, it's owned all, uh, by a couple of states as well and operated sometimes by us. In the case of Massachusetts, where they own from Boston to the state line, where we are their dispatcher and maintainer. Uh, New York and Connecticut own a piece from New Haven to New Rochelle, where Metro North the Commuter Railroad is the dispatcher and maintainer. So lots of complex relationships. Uh, all born out of sort of accidents of history and basically a response to bankruptcy, not some grand rational plan. Um, and so, yeah, this is really the, this is the epicenter of our corridor. Um, it is uh, in, a very busy uh, and, and, and interesting place, a through terminal. 
uh, for NJT, the New Jersey Transit and Amtrak, and a stub end terminal for Long Island Railroad. Um, and the busiest part of the entire North American rail network and the densest operation is right here where Amtrak and NJT come into uh, Penn Station on two very old tunnels, about 350 trains a day. Um, and um, it's the busiest and probably the most vulnerable portion of, of, uh, of, of the North American rail network. Um, so the NEC has been a, a pretty significant success story. We started with the railroad in 1976, actually, a little bit after we were a tenant originally of, from the freight railroad who owned it. And then, and then the railroad was eventually transferred to us um, because the freight railroad, which was organized actually, was sort of taken over by the government, created as a government corporation, wanted nothing to do with this big, ancient and difficult main line, which hadn't really, at that time, hadn't had any significant investment in about 25 years. Um, so they, they passed it on to us as well as all the big terminals and so forth that they could get rid of. They sold everything that they could uh, and kept everything worth keeping um, and passed the carcass on. And um, uh, we've done uh, as much as we could in the meantime to, uh, to improve the railway and, and, and have, have gone from a pretty different railway. We, we, it was a 100-mile-an-hour railroad with uh, jointed rail, um, uh, mechanical interlockings, uh, very old signal system, um, and we've gotten it up to a, 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 a I'll say, a, conv a modern, conventional railway, albeit still a very old one. Um, so it, it's, it's um, become a major part of the region. It's more than 50% of all rail commuters in America use this railway. Um, provides capacity that highway and air cannot. I, I, I could spend a lot of time talking about the degradation of the rest of the system, but just uh, suffice it to say, you really don't want to drive in this region and you really don't want to take, take, take a flight if you can avoid it. Um, and we actually, unfortunately, had a few instances of this last year. The, the, the shutdown of the Northeast Corridor has huge costs and ripples across the rest of the network. It's about a $100 million impact every day. We, we don't run this railway uh, on the region. Um, and it's very important to economic growth and expansion of markets and, and the labor pool. Um, an interesting sort of facet that we actually, Jim helped us sort of figure out uh, as a sort of benchmarking uh, is that we, um, 75% of our seller ridership is business, which, which is really quite high. Actually, 40% of our, our regional trains, our sort of conventional trains between Washington and New York are, are used by travelers who are traveling for business. So we have a, a very high percentage of business travelers using, uh, using this route for, for uh, business purposes. Um, we have a, a lot of development, 100 million, 100, 100 million or so square feet of active development around our station areas. Unfortunately, we own really almost none of the property to be developed. Again, sort of sold or kept before our time. Um, so capturing that upside is uh, something we dream about but have trouble doing. Um, and um, we have a very high percentage of knowledge sector jobs near our, uh, our stations, which is quite different um, than sort of the, the, the U.S. generally and, and most cities generally. So we're able to cater to a, an industry that relies on um, transportation and quick access to other, uh, both you know, typically industries and, um, and colleagues, uh, uh, given the, the sort of the knowledge economy in, in the Northeast, which, re which very much relies on um, a, a sort of mixture of, of people doing different things for different folks at different times. Um, and there have been targeted investments in stations, um, equipment, and infrastructure that has allowed some, some growth. We, we've doubled our, our traffic since 1976 in terms of train counts, so a big, a big increase there. Um, and mostly that was done just by filling up, frankly, a railroad that was very well built and built big, built primarily in the 1900 to 1930 period, so we were able to sort of reactivate latent capacity. Uh, and that's how we did most of that, and then make imp incremental improvements. Um, and we've had huge ridership, and ridership revenue and, and load factor increases, uh, as you saw before in the revenue. I mean, some big things we've been able to do, we, we are essentially at 100% load factors for three days a week in the peak on our cell trans. We, we have uh, um, typically at, at any one time 16 or so uh, sets in service, and we run about 16 and a few more, a few less um, daily departures. Um, 
And actually, yesterday was, and today hopefully will be too, a, a, a 14,000 passenger day on Acela, which means that we've sold every departure 100% three times. Um, so that means the usually we've had folks going from Washington to Philadelphia, their seat immediately then consumed Philadelphia to New York, and then a seat from Philadelphia or from New York to Boston. Um, so tremendous turnover. Um, and our, our record so far, I think, was a 15,500 15, or so passengers on those 16 round trips. Um, and you can see what's happened to the air rail market, where we've, we've become the dominant provider. Um, so this is rail versus all of air service combined uh, between Washington and New York. We introduced Acela, again, in the 2001 period, sort of a limited start. We finally really sort of hit our stride after some equipment problems. And, uh, in 2004, you actually see 2003 drop because and we had um, some big equipment problems in, in, in uh, 2003. Um, and now we're 76 between New York and Washington and Boston. We're at 56% between New York and Boston, so majority uh, there too. But we have a slower trip time there, uh, and uh, primarily due to the curvature of that railway and also the, the railway the portion we don't own, which is a 70 mile an hour slow commuter railroad for about 60 miles. Um, so a lot of opportunity in, the, in that, uh, in, in that um, market still. Uh, so there are a, a lot of big challenges that, that uh, unfortunately, unfortunately threaten the success. Um, so, I mean, it's a great challenge to have, but we've just got huge growth. We've been growing about 3% annually uh, on the corridor on inner city service for over a decade. Commuter's been growing about 2.5%. Um, and um, we have a very limited capacity. And, and really the sort of fundamental sort of argument I'm going to make today is that um, we're a railroad out of capacity that's got a lot of fragile assets. So we, we need to re both restore our assets and expand capacity because we've got huge growth uh, and massive demand that's uh, sort of untouched by us um, in, in, because of our the limited slots and, and seats that we, we can sell. Uh, asset agent condition, everything that we have is pretty much ancient and getting worse. Um, very few things we have are sort of of the modern era in terms of major assets. Um, under investment, we've had just decades of decapitalization in essence where we've not covered depreciation, not been making the investment to both sort of cover normalized replacement, let alone uh, uh, address some of the big outstanding issues. We've got a lot of problems with partnership and governance um, between all these players, nine tenant railroads, four owners, um, give or take four maintainers, operators of infrastructure, um, nine states, a federal government, a bunch of big cities with big mayors who think that they are states, um, and, uh, and really very little in the way of sort of maturation about how all this should be worked out and how people work together and um, a lot of bilateralism which has led to uh, some, some real challenges. Um, funding and financing, we, we have no regular funding source. Every year we just hope and pray the federal government is going to give us some money. They usually tell us sometime midway in the fiscal year, so we start a fiscal year with no budget, just a, a hope and running on some cash, and, and we get some money eventually. Um, that's really difficult to run a basically a $4 billion business on. Um, and um, one of the other big problems is that the the relationship for, of use and sort of capital investment is sort of all out of whack. That big majority of commuter users pay almost nothing in the way of capital to the railway. We're supposed to be the capital investor for the railway, but we're the minimal user. Um, so there's uh, some challenges there. And then finally, and a lot of that is caught up, caught up in this last issue, politics. Um, rail uh, and public transport are political topics, and they, they really lack actual consensus. Um, even when our government isn't completely dysfunctional, which it just happens to be at the moment, but if that were not the case, this would still be an issue. Um, so some, some major challenges. Uh, just to kind of go through them in detail, population growth I'll go through quickly, but we're 50 million or so, and um, you know, by 2040 we think probably another 12 or, or so million added to the mix. Uh, so the question is how will those folks get around? Uh, we think rail is... Um, pretty good way to, to do that and quite wonder how else you could do it, frankly. Um, here's 
course, passenger count that's going to stem from that growth in, 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 in population in the region. Uh, a couple of different options, but all of them equal essentially doubling, more or less, uh, over the next 30 years of, uh, of uh, demand. Um, and really, sort of what we leave on the table and what we take all depends on what sort of infrastructure and capacity we build. And that's why my main focus here is capacity, because what I'm interested in is, is meeting as much of that demand as I can uh, economically. And, um, and trying to take a, a, a big share of primarily auto trips. Just to give you a flavor, aviation and rail are about 10% of the inner city trip market in the Northeast. So you've got a lot, a lot of mode share uh, that uh, could be captured still. Um, here's our uh, centenarian assets. These are some of my faves. They're sort of uh, are, are tried and true, but they are all uh, in desperate need of replacement here. We have a lot of movable bridges, about 10 or so, uh, swing or lift. Um, and uh, we've got some old tunnels, the Baltimore Potomac Tunnel here. It's not a great picture. It's hard to show this tunnel well. Um, but that's from 1873, so, you know, just right after the Civil War. Um, and um, it's our main line, and, and that's... It's time. It's time for to uh, to give it a rest. Um, so um, we're facing major, major issues for these bridges, and uh, we've started the planning, uh, but there's just no money right now to sort of do any of this stuff, um, and and that's a major issue. And particularly, these movable bridges pose huge risks to the service because every once in a while they go up like this and decide not to come back down, um, and uh, and then you get you get some problems and some unhappy people uh, as they sit and wait. We have one bridge, I didn't show it here, but that's uh, actually, it's hand cranked. Um, and, and every once in a while, the yacht club that's on the other side, and Maritime has the right of way in US law. So when they want to move, we got to stop. And so the yacht club decides they want to send a little sailboat out. We got to send the people out there and crank up the bridge and stop all the traffic. Um, so um, on top of all those old assets, we had some, we've had some big things happen recently, Hurricane Sandy was one of them. You might have heard about it. Um, and really didn't help matters. Here you see um, path of travel for water into our Hudson River tunnels. These are 103-year-old um, tubes that are uh, it's actually built on the bottom of the river. They rise and fall with the tide. They're cast iron. Um, and um, they filled with a couple million gallons of water, as did two of our tunnels under the East River when Sandy uh, hit New York and flooded the region. Um, they came actually across through, the, through the, uh, um, this yard, which is the West Side Yard, which is a Long Island Railroad facility, and then around into our tunnel portals. And here down here, you can, you can see that's the, the yard underwater. That's our, the nice little river here in the tunnel. And actually, this was the one that didn't get much damage. Um, two of our tunnels were completely filled to the roof. Um, and it took four days to get all the water out and get the railroad back. In the meantime, the, the railroad was stopped. And it was a good lesson for us and helped us, helped me, people like me, quantify exactly what happens when the thing goes down. Uh, we would never choose to have it happen, but um, we did learn some lessons and got some attention. Um, so, um, you know, I, it's pretty simple. You get what you pay for, and let me compliment you as a nation for for investing. I think um, and and as appropriately, what I would first say, and and um, aggressively in your system. Here's just the basic picture. This is what the United States government spends on highways. This big mountain here. This is the aviation network, and here is the rail network, right here. Um, so um, this is the picture of. Of, uh, of transportation investment in, in the U.S. And uh, it's against this backdrop that we're sort of trying to make, um, make things better. Um, so the, the sort of net result of all that is in order to accommodate the growth that we see on the existing conventional railway and rebuild the assets that are at the end of their useful life, um, it's about a $50 billion program between now and 2030. Uh, it's a lot of money. And um, there's a real challenge of how to do it and actually keep those 2,200 trains a day moving. Certainly you won't actually be able to keep all of them moving. Um, and um, 
with this kind of package, what you'll do is essentially harvest all of the available capacity that's there on the railway today, and then um, you're, you're sort of done after that. And it doesn't really change trip times. It doesn't sort of change performance levels beyond, say, reliability um, all that much. So you get the, sort of get the railway at its sort of maximal um, sort of potential with this kind of investment program. Um, and serving all of the core users and their expected growth. Uh, the problem is that takes about two billion a year or so, um, and the current amount that we spend is uh, right about here, about 384 million a year on the railway. So we're a little more than a billion and a half short to just get the railway, I'd say, up to sort of modern standards to meet the basic projection of growth without changing the performance levels. Um, so we're working on that. Um, and I mentioned some things about governance. We, there's a, we've had a, a long history of sort of bilateralism in the Northeast Corridor where uh, sort of owners and operators get in a closet somewhere and negotiate sort of secret deals. And um, there's very little network visibility, very little transparency between what operators and owners do. Um, and that's created um, some real problems. It sort of was okay when everyone sort of had their, when, when there was not, when there was more capacity and there wasn't so much traffic, you could sort of do your own thing and you're part of the railway and not be so worried about what the downstream effects might be. But that's really changed now. Now, uh, you know, a hiccup in Baltimore is a sneeze in Philadelphia is a full-blown flu in New York. These, the impacts of, uh, of, uh, problems on the railway or capacity constraints um, uh, go up and down the railway. Um, so we're really, we need a new planning paradigm and a, a new process for system collaboration. Um, we need to really build a, a framework of partnership between owners and operators. Um, operators, you know, tend to sort of ignore the infrastructure owner uh, if they can. I mean, I don't blame them. They almost all own their own infrastructure that I got to worry about. Um, but um, uh, it's really, it's got to end because the infrastructure that we've been ignoring for a long time is really critical to their systems. Uh, and infrastructure has essentially been sort of subsidizing operations. We've not been charging the operators what it costs really to either maintain or recapitalize the railway. Um, and, and that's just got to end. Um, there's definitely a need for sort of change in access uh, pricing and capacity allotment and slot allocation and so forth, and we're working on some of that. Um, and then there's a real need to integrate our services and to connect with other modes so that we really have a, a more functional network. There's a lot of opportunities there, but you don't see any through ticketing between us and commuter railways, you know, shared timetables. Uh, from a passenger perspective, it's a difficult system to use if you want to use other systems. Um, and those are just just those are just dumb moves, actually, is what, what they are. But they're, there's lacking in the, in the sort of wheel effort, time, energy to kind of come up and solve it. So we're trying to, to overcome that. Um, lack of funding, you know, there just there isn't uh, enough money, and there's not a way to provide enough money under our current system. There's no way to do $50 billion programs in the United States sort of infrastructure funding and financing universe. They just don't, they do not exist. Um, we spend $50 billion on highways a year, but that means cutting $50 billion into 50 individual checks to 50 states, and they go out and spend that money. We just don't do big projects, and we also don't do multi-year projects or multi-decades long projects, which, is, uh, which these projects are. Um, and uh, you know, typically, capital outlays predate revenues in a, in a pretty significant way. We have a long environmental process, so we have a timing problem. Um, Multi-state participation is very difficult. They basically, you know, if sort of it's not in your state, you're not interested in funding it, and the idea that you might spend money from, you know, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the state of Maryland is, is anathema politically. Uh, so trying to figure out how different um, states and local governments participate in a network is a challenge, uh, particularly in places where there are, you know, benefits uh, from doing so, but the investments require spreading money in, in distant places. Um, there's a whole conversation about what the balance is between federal, state, and local funding at the moment right, or at right now, um, how you solve for that and what the right role is. Uh, clearly, private sector participation is, is of interest, and it could be helpful and, and, in fact, key in certain areas, but it's clearly also not a panacea. This is not a railway that someone 
um, you know, that somebody swoops in and buys and uh, does all the investment for you and, and, uh, and makes your problems go away. Um, there's a, there's got to be a public-private relationship there, and the public sector has been pretty, pretty absent. Um, and uh, finally, you know, all this stuff's got to be viewed in a sort of network, a total network capacity uh, and context. And so, you know, we have a hard time doing that. We particularly think modally, and we also think if we should deign to think outside of just one mode and think about multi-modes, we are not thinking about other sectors that have big influence on transport like housing and, um, and, and, uh, and, and energy. Um, so political consensus here, um, I, I just put this up as to sort of, here's, the, here, here's myself and the vice president. Um, and I used to work in the Senate and, and, and had pleasure of working with him quite regularly. He's uh, known as Amtrak Joe. He rode um, uh, the, our, our trains for his 30 year Senate career every day. He's logged something like, I mean, you know, 500,000 miles or something insane on our trains. And you would think that here he and I are sitting there shaking hands about the great investment that America will make in Amtrak and passenger rail, something we both believe in. Um, and if that handshake and, you know, two pounds will get you a cup of tea. Um, so w w you can have great political leadership um, in one part of the government, but it does not amount to uh, a program, a plan, or funding. And so we have a very supportive administration and great leadership in, in the president and vice president for rail. Um, they've just proposed a $19 billion program of investment over four years across the U.S. network. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is rail is a very partisan issue because rail development is regional. If you know, to go back to that big map, what you see are these uh, long distance corridors across the bulk of the country and then corridor development on the coast. And the real issue is that passenger rail's main audience and value is to the major urban centers in America and the major urban centers in America are controlled by Democrats. And the rest of the country is controlled by Republicans. And uh, the Republicans rightfully sort of say, well, you know, why do I, why do I want to pay for that? Um, and, uh, and so we have a, 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 a huge urban-rural divide that breaks along politically, and, um, and rail gets caught very much in that, along with public transit and a whole other sort of big city issues. Um, there's also some generational bias. The political leadership in this country primarily came of age during the highway and interstate era. And, you know, that period in America, people really thought, you know, railways were dead. I mean, not, I mean, not just thought it, really were planning as if it had happened and, and expected it to be the case. Um, there's a, the lack of private sector involvement is a challenge for us at times. I mean, it creates this perception that there's sort of not real value here. If people with money who make money aren't in big players, then um, there must be something wrong. Um, uh, other modes perceive rail as a threat primarily to their sort of spoils. As you saw that big map, there's a lot of cash going to other modes and everyone's afraid the pot doesn't get bigger, it just gets divided to more mouths. Um, state and local governments aren't well organized, even if they're supporters. Uh, and then freight railroads um, are quite ambivalent to our presence and passenger rail generally. Uh, we get in the way of their trains that make a lot of money. And uh, rail labor, which is a big political force, is politically aligned with one party. So um, their influence is, goes up and down depending on the, the, the party. Um, so anyway, to sort of deal with all this, we're um, focused a lot on trying to create sort of plans and visions that demonstrate the value opportunities uh, that, that, that are out there, looking to find new funding and financing tools and paradigms, building new processes for collaboration and partnership, and trying to build political support. Um, and so some other just key things here. Clearly, we've got to keep running the railway well um, to sort of get um, support growing. And um, we've got to build alliances with other folks who rely on the railway, but who we traditionally haven't been uh, all that organized with, um, as you, you see sort of the sections here. And then finally, we at, at Amtrak have to change as the sort of this universe changes as well. Um, so we've been doing some planning. You can go online and see any of our plans for the Northeast Corridor out there. And, um, and you know, if you're interested, I encourage you to do that. We're doing some successive planning around the future of the corridor. 
primarily to influence a federal process that's now underway that's really sort of define the future of the corridor, uh, at least its sort of upper envelope. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we have sort of two overlapping progressive programs. One is a sort of an upgrade of the existing railway, and two is the um, development of a dedicated high-speed railway. So here I think we really have a corollary to the West Coast mainline and HS2. And, and we found ourselves in really the same conclusion, which is we have a, a railway and it needs a lot of work. Um, and when push comes to shove, it needs a lot more capacity. So the only way to add capacity, uh, because we're already more or less a four-track railway, three-track railway some places, but is, is to take more property and to add more track. And if one is going to do that, then we have an opportunity to think about what sort of railway do we want to build. And we're going to be building on structure and tunnel and so forth anyway because of the density here. Um, there, there is no green field uh, to tra traverse. Um, and um, and the, I think the other important, sort of two other important aspects of this is that, um, you know, we have huge, huge markets in which reduced trip time correlates very strongly into um, to greater market share, and um, we have the need to create bypasses essentially to the existing railway where we rebuild, and we really have to separate our faster services from our slower services because the differential of speed and stopping pattern is a nightmare and consumes tons of capacity that if we could create a more homogeneous railway uh, with a more homogeneous operation, we could dramatically increase service on the existing railway and then unlock lots of great capacity on the high-speed railway. Um, so um, here's just a quick diagram of what we hope for. It's a, and this system actually does sort of look a lot like the JRE system, in fact, sort of a, a, a 220 mile an hour dedicated high-speed railway that also connects to the conventional railway both adjacent to it and to the branches that feed it and a combination of different services and skip stop and express and so forth and all things that you would all be familiar with um, and just to sort of give you some sense we you know the the difference is quite dramatic um, you know he, here's sort of uh, the, the breakdown if we sort of have a system like this where we're able to kind of can create a whole new high-speed rail system we're able to get to some pretty phenomenal uh, uh, passenger numbers and um, some very significant revenue. And in and, and the absence of, of sort of building a railway like that, here, here's sort of where we, we think we, we end up. I mean, on the existing conventional railway, this is the absolute maximum we think we get. We essentially sort of level off at that period. And there's, we've, you know, our trains are as long as they can go, and we've used every available slot. Um, and, uh, and, and so we... Um, we, we really think there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of smart value in this uh, approach. The, the problem is it costs a lot of money to do this. So you know, 50 billion for the conventional railway, and let's say another 75 or 50 or so for the high-speed one. So now you're talking about a basically a hundred billion dollar project over a 40-year period, 30-year, 40-year period. But you know, when you average that, it's still a cheap date compared to that giant mountain of highway money. Um, so. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think it's well within our means. Um, when push comes to shove, HS2 is not going to be uh, a, a, a cheap railway either, but I think it's the right move. Um, so all of this planning is, is going into something called the NEC Future Process, which is led by our Department of Transportation's sort of rail regulator and planner, the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, they're doing a three-year uh, environmental and service development planning process to look at the railway um, and essentially what they'll do is create sort of a maximal envelope. Here are the services and the infrastructure you could build um, uh, over the period between now and 2040. And um, our plans and a lot of the work we've been doing is essentially to feed that process and, and help inform them about what we think makes sense uh, to do with our railway. Um, and uh, they'll produce some per, uh, essentially a preferred alternative, which is looking at all the different variants of, you know, new build and improvement, different types of improvement, different types of service, uh, and that'll be uh, govern what we can build and operate in this window. Um, it unfortunately doesn't commit the federal government in any way uh, to fund any of this, which would really be the ideal situation, is they make a decision about what to do and actually then do it. Um, 
but it does prevent folks from doing things that are counter to it. Uh, so if we get a sort of plan and we said here's a new alignment to be built sometime over the next 40 years, uh, it will prevent entities from going and deciding to, to uh, preclude or interfere with those sort of things. Um, and then, of course, there's still environmental process that we go through, as, uh, as you all do as well, for individual projects when we go to build something. Um, and you see collaboration. So here's just some of our commuter brethren and us. Um, the one thing that very significant that had happened recently was the creation of a Northeast Quarter Commission. It was created by statute. It uh, brings together all the sort of players here, states, commuter railways, uh, Amtrak, uh, the Department of Transportation, and actually the freight railways, too. And uh, we're out to try and fix all those bad problems that I mentioned um, about collaboration. And uh, one of the first things we have to do is come up with a new allocation methodology to have everyone paying their fully allocated cost for shared use infrastructure. We're supposed to don't negotiate that in a very friendly, collaborative way. Um, it's not going all that well. Um, but, uh, but I think we'll get there, uh, hopefully. And if we don't, there's a backstop. There's a regulator who will come in and just impose it on all of us. So we do have some... Um, motivation to, to sort of at least set our own destiny. Um, and um, this commission is actually quite useful. It really is, uh, creates a forum for us to do shared research, uh, make recommendations, and gives us a vehicle for advocacy in the, in the quarter. And I, if anyone who's really interested in this, you just Google uh, Northeast Quarter Commission and you'll see some great work that we've already done so far on the, uh, on the railway and, and uh, what needs to happen. Um, political outlook for rail. Um, as I said, the authorization bills are these bills in Congress that sort of establish a program and lay out policy. The one for passenger rail just expired. Um, that's not unusual to have sort of nothing in the, for a period of time until Congress gets its act together to do something again. Um, there's, um, there, there, in, in addition to the Amtrak funding that's been out there against a billion and a half dollars or so, um, there was a huge lop of money in 2009, 2010, $10 billion into the system. Primarily went to sort of small projects across the, the country, so spread out. A lot of uh, projects that are, that are quite good. The, the Northeast Quarter got about a billion of that um, in total uh, that we're still spending now. Um, um, but the, since that time, there's been zero dollars in additional investment. So again, sort of been a big spike and which is quite hard to consume efficiently when you just suddenly show up with a lot of dollars and then it all goes away. Um, we're looking for a billion and six this year uh, coming up. We'll see. And we also have proposed to keep the, the money we earn uh, from the Northeast Corridor. So just to give you a basic sense, Northeast Corridor, um, it's about a third of the ridership, but it's about 50% of the revenue. It earns sort of free cash, not including depreciation and so forth, about $300 million a year off a billion dollars in ticket revenue. But we take that $300 million a year and apply it to a roughly $700 million loss for our long distance network, uh, thereby bringing our total operating loss down. Um, and so what we've proposed to Congress is actually that long distance network, we've said you really should cover the full operating loss and you should let us keep the money we make in the Northeast Corridor and let us put that back into capital. So they won't give us capital to do any of this stuff. Just let us keep the money we earn and spend on capital. Um, we'll see what Congress says. Um, but it's getting to a crisis point. The railway's getting worse, actually, a little bit every year. Uh, we really do need to spend more money there. Um, I mentioned California just because I'm sure people know that there's a project out there. Um, it's facing very significant funding risk, and, and I mean, I think there's some major issues uh, because primarily of this issue. There, there's been no federal funding, and their business plan relies on very significant federal funding um, in addition to state funding, and it's just not there. Um, and there's also challenges in raising the state money that they have to, to match the earlier federal dollars. Um, our big hope for salvation here is uh, the Everything except Amtrak, for the most part, gets done in a big surface transportation authorization bill that actually includes the funding mechanisms, and it's a strange sort of hybrid bill. Um, and our dream has always been to be in the party, uh, be part of the sort of total package, share in both the revenue that's raised from the taxation schemes and other things, and then uh, sort of be um, one with the, the larger surface transportation universe. Um, for the first time, the administration has proposed just that. The Obama administration just did, uh, and that's fantastic. Um, but they didn't propose a funding mechanism to sort of increase the amount of revenue to provide the 
additional spending. So you're going to run into a big budget problem uh, in the U.S. And the core program itself is already essentially bankrupt for highways. The gas tax is too low, uh, and uh, the needs are quite great. So there's something um, something's going to happen. I'm not sure when, uh, but there is maybe some opportunity there. Um, we're working on innovative financing ideas. Uh, you know, in the absence of cash from anybody else, we're looking under every rock uh, that we can turn uh, turn over. If anyone knows any, you know, spare billions around, <laughs> let me know. Um, we're changing uh, uh, ourselves. I, I do again. So, so Robert Reed plays sort of into this that we've really adopted a um, a, a business line organization. Uh, I, I think quite similar to what um, so Br went through under his leadership. Um, and it's a big transition away from sort of the functional operating model and sort of traditional disciplines into businesses built around our core products. Um, and we're very much still in that transition, but I think it's the right one and will help increase transparency uh, and, um, and let these products, which are all quite different, sort of have their own lives. Um, and some of those lives are probably doomed to failure and others are, have maybe great success. We'll see. Um, we're thinking about infrastructure and assets as really a sort of discrete business with customers and suppliers, which is a pretty big change for us. Um, and we're thinking about governance and sort of joint capital and planning with all our brethren on the Northeast Corridor as we get into a more collaborative framework where everyone is contributing. Um, getting ready for big projects. We hope to do some one day. Uh, we need to, and so we're trying to build the capacity to do that. Um, working on safety, which is always the really the first agenda for us. And we're relative, you know, pretty safe railroad in, uh, in the U.S., but there is a lot to do in um, changing our culture, which I think is really the issue across the railroad industry, across the world, is, um, is our, first, our first mission, is to create a, a, a different culture around reducing risk um, and uh, approaching safety more proactively. Lots of technology that we're trying out, e-ticketing, Wi-Fi, some innovation there, which has been good, and trying to build a workforce for a future. Half of uh, Amtrak's managers will be retired in five years. That's a, uh, it's, a, it's, it's gonna be a lonely, lonely place for me. Um, so, <laughs> trying to add, folks. Um, I'm just gonna say the sort of good news here is that we are starting on some big projects, uh, primarily in the planning phase, but there is action happening. The Gateway program is our, our biggest, is about a $20 billion, give or take, program to build new tunnels into New York. Uh, expand Penn Station and um, improve the railway here through northern New Jersey. Um, there are, there's 25 slots an hour into New, New York. We consume them all. That's it. And they rely on 103-year-old tunnels that just had a couple million gallons of water in them and um, are in very serious shape. So we really have to build two new tunnels uh, so that we can close the existing tunnels and rebuild them. And in the end, we end up hopefully with a nice modern four-track railway into New York. Um, this is really the sort of the two-track um, bottleneck on what is otherwise a four-track railroad, and again, 350 trains a day trying to go in here on, you know, two-minute headways um, at, at 90 miles an hour under the river into Penn Station. Um, and then to expand all that capacity, you've got to expand Penn Station, which is completely full uh, and no platform space and is a dreary, absolutely sort of disaster of a terminal in the first place. Um, there was once a great station, bulldozed, and we, again, left with the, the basement there. Um, so that's happening most explicitly right here, where we have started building our tunnel. Um, just 800 feet of it, which is uh, not, not all that much. But what was going to happen was is, uh, the place we wanted to build our tunnel one day um, is having this built on it, which is $15 billion, six-block um, mega project called Hudson Yards. It's got more commercial real estate uh, in that six block period than the entire city of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, these buildings are taller than the Empire State Building right here, just to give you a sense. Yeah, it's a, the little Empire State Building right there. Um, this is a massive, massive development. And if this thing got built before we built this, this would never happen. We would never, ever have more tunnels into Penn Station. Um, and without more tunnels into Penn Station, it's quite hard to figure out how you replace the old tunnels into Penn Station and what do you do with uh, 300,000 people a day who use that railway. So um, we are building a big, what we call sort of affectionately the tunnel box, which is 
a tunnel with no tracks in it, essentially right here, and then we will slowly move across this site. Right now, this part's being developed. We're building right here, and now we're proposing we'll continue over, and as long as this thing gets built, we just keep moving and building underneath it for a future tunnel at some later date. Um, there's a, a lot of station work going on in the Northeast. We own many of the big major terminals. Um, one of the more exciting things is Moynihan Station, which is actually the sort of remnant of the original Penn Station. This is the old post office built as part of the complex uh, by the original architects across the street from Penn Station. We are going to move into that terminal um, as it gets turned into a big train hall. It'll be a great space for us. There's a, a small phase one that's underway that connects Penn Station, which is this side of the, of the building. Um, to uh, the sort of lower level of, uh, of, of Moynihan. Uh, this is the Farley Post Office. Its name, the station name will be Moynihan Station. Um, and so we'll move across the street. We'll still own Penn Station, but it'll primarily be turned into a commuter terminal. And we will, with our commuter partners, completely redevelop that, uh, is, is the hope. Um, and then we're working on our other station uh, projects. Um, we have all of our big stations are going through master plans right now because they all have big either problems with their current state uh, in terms of the buildings or major capacity issues at the track and platform level or big development opportunities. So um, all of them underway. Here's some of those bridges I mentioned, Susquehanna. Um, we, have, we have a lot of them that we are in the development phase and planning phase or environmental phase for replacing. Again, the, the big issue is that, you know, doing the planning work is 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Doing the replacing work is a billion. Uh, so the question is where to get the billion for them, but um, that's absolutely important to have the plan first. Um, and then, sort of very excitingly, we're, we're procuring new high-speed trains uh, to augment our cell set um, first and then eventually replace it when it comes time. And we're doing that jointly with California uh, at the moment. And um, uh, our hope is to, to buy sort of eight initial train sets. And what's interesting for us is we're, we're, we've been able to sort of go out finally and procure from the market. Uh, always the U.S. you've had to sort of build bespoke train sets before this to meet the requirements for um, crash worthiness in the U.S. The whole regime was built around running a passenger train into an 18,000 ton freight train and trying to let people survive. Now the regulatory regime has changed a little bit and they sort of realize that the best way is to prevent the accident from ever happening. Um, so now we can buy on the international market. And so we're, we're in the middle of trying to do that um, and uh, eventually get, you know, um, a couple of dozen uh, new trains uh, in the market. And, and our goal, and as soon as we get the trains, do it is to be able to have um, two to three peak period uh, high speed trips between New York and Washington which we think there's a lot of demand for. Um, and finally, we did just get some new locomotives for our conventional set. These are some uh, Siemens products based off the well-known European uh, Sprinter uh, locomotive for our conventional fleet. And um, so far, they're great um, and replace some very weary, um, so well-worn uh, locomotives. So that's the Northeast Corridor. Um, yeah, I tried to hit the highlights. I'm sure I've missed a lot, and you may have questions about the rest of the country, which I'm happy to answer too, but uh, I appreciate your time and attention. Thanks. Steve.